On December 6, 1912, a team led by German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt was inspecting a site in Minya province, Egypt, on the eastern banks of the Nile River, a few hundred kilometers away from present-day Cairo. This was the site where Akhetaten stood, the short-lived capital of ancient Egypt during the Amarna period. Borchardt and his crew were working on the ruins of what was once the studio and workshop of Thutmose, not to be confused with a number of pharaohs with the same name. This particular Thutmose was an official court sculptor, even called the king's favorite and master of works, and was a prominent practitioner of the Amarna style, known for its drastic departure from traditional Egyptian artworks. So, when Borchardt and the workers found the site which they believed to be Thutmose's workshop, they already knew they would find a treasure trove of artifacts. In fact, everyone was so enthusiastic and excited that a few high-ranking nobles, including Prince Johann Georg of Saxony, arrived at the site to witness the digging. However, nothing would prepare them for the most stunning archaeological find in their lives, not even a seasoned scholar like Borchardt. Unearthed near the eastern and western walls of Thutmose's studio, the bust of an ancient Egyptian queen amazed everyone on site not only because of its obvious historical and cultural importance, but more so for its realistic features. Made from limestone, the stucco-coated bust was painted in full color and crafted with care, detailed to the point that you could see finer details like laugh lines, neck tendons, and her cheekbones, all of which were never seen before in any ancient Egyptian sculptures. The bust was so beautiful and lifelike that it left Borchardt and everyone around him virtually speechless. And yet, this important find eventually became one of the most enduring symbols of ancient Egypt and an icon of feminine beauty. This was the bust of Nefertiti, a queen whose life was shrouded in mystery and controversy, and her background, fate, and death remained a subject of debate to this day. But why is it that despite her immense beauty and power, she was considered by some as the most hated female pharaoh in history. Before we answer that question, let's go back in time to see what we could find out about this enigmatic queen. Queen Nefertiti was the wife of Akhenaten, a pharaoh belonging to the 18th dynasty, between 1353 BCE to 1336 BCE. However, prior to her marriage and ascension, her background was virtually unknown. Even Nefertiti's origin was disputed. The most accepted theory, however, was that Nefertiti was the daughter of Ai, a high-ranking official during the reign of Akhenaten and a future pharaoh himself. However, even that was only a conjecture, as it wasn't stated anywhere that Ai was the father of Nefertiti. Nefertiti was said to have married Akhenaten, then still called Amenhotep before when she was 15 or 16. Thus began Nefertiti's life as the main consort, favorite, and great royal wife of Amenhotep IV, so much so that she likely ruled alongside him and may have even become a co-regent during and after his reign, with some believing that she actually had assumed sole rulership after his death. The Great Royal Wife Reliefs, statuettes, and fragments that have survived the wrath of the succeeding pharaohs almost always portrayed Nefertiti and Amenhotep Ayrf close to each other, usually with Nefertiti standing behind Amenhotep Y4 in the classic stance of the supporting queen. However, there are plenty of unique things about the Amarna style that departed so much from the traditional portrayals of ancient Egyptian monarchs and their families. For instance, in some artworks, Nefertiti and Amenhotep IV are seen worshipping the sun god Aten alongside their six daughters, Meritaten, Mekitaten, Ankesenpaten, Neferneferuten, Teshirit, Neferneferuru, and Setenpenri. Indeed, it was rare for any ancient Egyptian carvings and statues to feature a family unit, much like it did with Nefertiti and Amenhotep IV. However, that wasn't all. Nefertiti was also seen smiting her enemies, decorating her throne with captured soldiers, and even worshipping Aten Soli, 
privileges and duties that were all reserved for the pharaoh alone. These portrayals lead scholars to believe that Nefertiti may have played a large role in running the empire and the state religion at the same time. Truly, Akhenaten's rule was marked by the shifting of state religion, from traditional polytheism to a monolatry, with a focus on the sun deity Aten. It was so revolutionary for the time that nowadays it's considered as the first form of known monotheism worship. And so, in a world where polytheism was the norm and way of life, this was a rather radical move, even from the pharaoh and his wife. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this act proved to be unpopular and even controversial among the ancient Egyptians. Not only were the general public hesitant at this sudden change on who to worship, but the aristocrats, particularly the priests, were not at all pleased. During the New Kingdom era, Amun was the chief god worshipped in the empire. Karnak, his temple, was located in Thebes, the capital city at the time. So, when Amenhotep IV and Nefertiti made this bold move of changing the worship from Amun to Aten, they closed all the temples of other gods, particularly Karnak. However, their devotion to Aten didn't end with the forced closure and sometimes brutal destruction of temples dedicated to other deities. They, later on, moved to another newfound city and declared it as the capital, naming it Akitaten, which means Horizon of Aten. Around the same time, Amenhotep IV changed his name to Akhenaten, which means effective for Aten, symbolizing his undying dedication to the new chief god he wanted his people to worship. In the midst of these bewildering and never-before-seen changes being enacted in ancient Egyptian religion and culture, Nefertiti stood beside her husband in making sure these new laws were upheld to the last letter. Both acted as the rulers of Egypt and the chief priests of the new religion. Later on, Akhenaten and Nefertiti were also worshipped as deities and formed a trinity together with Aten, with the sun god at the top. Although the cult of Aten existed before Akhenaten's reign, it was the husband and wife duo who made it the center of worship in the empire, or at least have successfully done so for a short while. Like what was said earlier, this change proved to be unpopular among the masses, especially the high priests of Amun. Before that, the high priests, particularly in Thebes, wielded so much power that they could influence the pharaoh's decisions directly. This change of state religion removed much of the high priest's power, which apparently they didn't forget even after Akhenaten's demise. How Akhenaten died remained a mystery. Some say he was assassinated, while others say he simply fell ill and died. However, it was assumed he met his demise during the 17th year of his reign. He was replaced by Smenkeri, who may have also been his co-regent while he was alive. Then, another pharaoh only known in the historical records as nefer nefer replaced Smenkkeri for an enigmatic reason. nefer nefer reign herself was only short-lived, as she was quickly replaced by the now famous Tutankhamun, who may have or may have been Akhenaten's son. But where was Nefertiti in all of these? Like Akhenaten, her fate was unclear. However, if you had been paying close attention, you might have spotted a tantalizing clue as to what may have become of her. What happened to Nefertiti? By the time of Tutankhamun, almost all historical records, artworks, and structures pertaining to Akhenaten and Nefertiti were destroyed. How and why? Through the shocking process of Damnatio Memoriae. In its simplest terms, Damnatio Memorai is the systematic destruction of the memory, records, and legacy of a damned person, such as a traitor or a tyrannic ruler. It was popular in Rome, but before it was done to the likes of Nero and Caligula, it was also practiced in Mesopotamia and, of course, ancient Egypt. Rulers and nobilities who were deemed enemies of the state were subjected to Damnatio Memoriae, especially if the successors were antagonistic towards them. 
As for a ruler and his wife who tried to coerce people into believing a different god, it wasn't surprising that Akhenaten and Nefertiti were subjected to the condemnation of memory. The enactor of this was none other than Tutankhamun, who was related to Akhenaten himself, but possibly through a different mother. Tutankhamun, originally called Tutankhaten himself, changed his name the moment he revered the state religion back to the worship of Amun. Well, being a boy king, it's believed that the idea might not have been his, but rather, he was convinced by the high priests of Amun. Still, to give credit where credit was due, Tutankhamun was a bit more tolerant. He didn't order the persecution of the cult of Aten and didn't command others to worship Amun only. And so, the main cult of Aten persisted for a decade or so before fading into obscurity. Then again, Tut wasn't as lenient to the instigators as he did to the cult. Akhenaten and Nefertiti were condemned, which is the reason why there is scant official records of them. Their bodies were never even discovered to this day. There were no clues as to where they were buried, too. Akhenaten as a pharaoh was simply replaced by another in the historical records. As for Nefertiti, she seemed to have vanished in the mists of history right after Akhenaten's reign ended. Or did she? Scholars debated as to what happened to the beautiful and powerful queen. Some theories arose, such as she may have been killed, exiled, or even committed suicide. However, one intriguing hypothesis amidst all these suggested tragic endings. The reason Nefertiti vanished in the historical records is simply because she changed her name and became a pharaoh herself. While this theory sounds so far off, many scholars now believe in this theory. Before 2012, the available records show that Nefertiti vanished sometime during the 12th year of Akhenaten's reign. Some supposed it was because one of her daughters died, and Nefertiti abandoned the faith of Aten. Akhenaten then banished her outside the city walls for this supposed betrayal, and grief-stricken Nefertiti either died from loneliness or suicide. However, a recent finding showed that she and her husband were well and alive during the 16th year of Akhenaten's reign. Then again, Akhenaten seemed to have died a year later. So, what became of Nefertiti? It was believed that she may have actually become a pharaoh. How? By adopting a masculine persona. In ancient Egypt, female pharaohs sometimes adopted male images to maintain the image of the pharaoh as a symbol of power and to conform to society's expectations of the figure of the ruler. In those times, it was believed that the pharaoh had to be male to maintain the proper order of the world, known as Mat. Now, do you remember the enigmatic female pharaoh who ruled right after Smenker, and how close her name sounds to Nefertiti? That's right. We're referring to Nefer Neferuaten. Let's make something clear first. It's exactly unknown if Nefertiti and Nefer Neferuaten was the same person. There were no existing records or even any clear indication that this was true. However, there were many clues that point to this being the case. The name Nefer Neferuaten literally means beautiful is the beauty of Aten. Some sources also indicate that Nefer Neferuaten was one of the titles of Nefertiti. While her name definitely sounds a lot like the one her daughter, Nefer Neferuaten Tesherit, has. Indeed, some suggested that the real identity of Nefer Neferuaten was the daughter instead of the mother. The records of Nefer Neferuaten's succession were murky at best, even that of Smenker. Who ascended first and who co-regented with whom was unclear. There were even indications that Nefer Neferuaten may have co-ruled with Akhenaten even when he was still alive. Some also suggested that Smenker may have been Nefertiti herself and took Meritaten as her great royal wife, with Meritaten later on taking the name Nefer Neferuaten before Tutankhamun ascended. That was confusing. But because the lack of historical records, scholars can only assume as much. And until such time, more concrete evidence that survived Tutankhamun's purge will be found later on. If indeed Nefertiti took the reins after her husband's death, it wasn't the first time that a female pharaoh ascended to the throne. 
Some hundred years before their reign, Hatshepsut became the third female pharaoh after her husband's demise, perhaps taking on a male persona thereafter. While she was considered one of the most powerful pharaohs of all time, she would soon fall into Damnatio Memoriae, instigated by her successors. However, unlike Hatshepsut, who had a relatively more successful and longer rulership, Nefertiti only reigned for a very short time, even as a co-regent with Akhenaten. He was only in power for around 17 years, and it's generally assumed that if she ever did assume co-regency with him, she only did so during the latter years of his reign. Moreover, both Smenker and Neferneferoiten, whom she was both identified with, only ruled for two years each. What makes her reign even more tragic is that if she did ascend to full regency, her reign marked the swift downfall of the religion she so arduously built with her husband. In a few years after Akhenaten's death, the royal family deserted Akhenaten and returned to Thebes. Nefertiti's life was indeed mysterious, fascinating and extraordinary to say the least. She was the most powerful woman of her time, and yet she seems to have disappeared with a bygone age. But was she really as hated as some people say? There is no definitive evidence of this, but there are many circumstantial clues that indicate it. The first is her close association with Akhenaten and atheism, an act so heretical that Amenhotep IV will forever be known in history as the heretic king. Here, the hatred probably emanated from the high priests and pious worshippers of gods other than Aten. Imagine that suddenly from today, you are told that you can no longer believe in your god but are obliged to believe in Aton. You will hardly accept this without a drop of resentment against the one who forced you. The next question to ask is what were they like with Akhenaten as ruler? Aside from the systematic closing of temples throughout ancient Egypt and attempts to change the state religion, which brings us to what was just said, there is no other historical record that mentions their atrocities. However, a recent study of the cemetery at Amarna suggests that Akhenaten and Nefertiti may have subjected children and teenagers to forced labor to build their new capital. Starvation, overwork, injury, disease, and poverty were visible on the remains found. If this was true, then it is all the more reason not to be hated. To be fair, we should mention that other pharaohs did the same when building their huge projects. However, there is another but here. This is the relatively unusual young age of the children used. Most of them were between the ages of 7 and 15. The next clue is that if indeed Nefertiti did co-rule in her last years with her husband and the next few after his death, her reign marks the rapid decline of the religion she so painstakingly built with him. Naturally, this in turn almost led to resentment in the adherence of the new ideology. And we come to perhaps one of the most significant clues. For someone to go to the trouble of erasing your name present for the last 20 years in history, it is unlikely that people had warm feelings towards you after all. It is most likely the multi-layered hatred of Nefertiti that is the reason her life, fate, and death are a mystery many are trying to solve today. It is strange that the Amarna period, in which Egyptian civilization flourished, ended abruptly. Yet it is also one of the most mysterious eras in ancient Egyptian history. Hated or not, the legacy of the Amarna period is still visible today. Not only because of the first monotheistic religion, but also because of the significant artistic changes that were imposed. Continue your adventure by watching our playlists. And if you want more, just play the next episode that comes up as a suggestion on your left.